Okay, I'm going to move on to a different topic. It's a little bit different than what... I think it's a little easier to see if I turn off the front lights. If I turn off all the lights, everybody falls asleep that's there. So I don't know where the rest of our class is, but there they usually show up within 10 to 15 minutes late. Right there. Okay. So I don't know. <laughs> Are you asleep or reading? <laughs> he's smiling like he's like he's sound asleep with his phone in front of him. That or he's got a football match on his phone. That's there. <laughs> which is it? Be honest, which one? Are you watching football or are you sleeping? What? Oh, watching watching something. Okay. That there. Yeah, usually when I see somebody like that, it's they're either sound asleep or they've got a football match on their phone or a TV show or something that there. And the reason I say it's football is because he had no sound on it. That there. If it was some kind of drama or something or a movie, the sound would be loud enough, we'd all hear it that there. But people, and I'll be honest, I've got football stored on my laptop that I'll watch from time to time too. But it's not your football. This is the American football where people actually get hurt during games. That there. Yeah. One thing about American sports versus Malaysian sports or international sports is American football and basketball and hockey. Those types of sports actually result in serious injuries, typically, to the players that there. So, and as large as I am, you would probably be surprised if I told you that I was not large enough to play football that there. So, I can slam. So, I am I'm considered too small to be a football player in the U.S. That there, I'm too short, and I'm not. My legs aren't strong enough that there. I'm just not. And I'm not fast enough to be a be a runner, so so I, I just did not play football. I actually, when I was in high school, I ran track, and then later on, I was a long distance runner until I tore my knees up. And then the one thing about sports like running or swimming or anything that's very aerobic, when you stop doing them and you continue to eat like you were like you're running 10 miles a day, <laughs> you, your weight will double in five years. Out there, and that's exactly what happened to me. If I showed people, if I showed everyone a picture of me at 35, and then I showed the, showed the same picture of me at 40, you would see that my weight went from about 50 kg, 55 kg, to about 110 kg in about five or six years. And the only difference was is I tore my knee up, and before before that I was running about eight to nine miles every day. That's there, probably six days a week I took one day off. And I was running about one race a week during the season. That was a, a 10K to 20K, and I ran about one marathon a year, which is 26 miles that there. So, so I, I used to run a, a lot. And then when you, when you tear a knee, that there. I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with what's called the ACL. It's the joint in your knee. I tore mine completely that there, and I had to have, I put a replacement in, but the replacement was never the same that there. Okay, let's get on to our topic that there, since I've already started the recording, and anybody's watching this from, from outside this class, and one of the things I've discovered since I've been putting these up on YouTube is that not only students in this class watch these videos, matter of fact, I'm expecting that more people from outside this class than in the class watch these videos because I get questions emailed to me from various places overseas. You know, I've had them from South Africa, from the Middle East, people asking questions about my videos, so, out there. So, just as I steal slides from other people, I've also had people steal my slides, out there. I kind of joked last semester, I went to steal some slides for a lecture, and I discovered that my slides that I used four or five years ago were the best ones out there, and they were on a site called SlideShare. So somebody's been taking my slides from my websites and putting them on slide sharing sites. So my slides are, a lot of my old slides are out there too. And I will probably write new slides for this over the summer break for these, this class. I started teaching with this processor with this group of students here you know, UDKL last January. So this is my second, third time through this course. I 
pretty much know where this course is going to stay, so now I'm going to actually start assembling it the right way. So I co commented yesterday, I think, to some people, I don't know whether it's this class, that these courses tend to change a lot year to year. I'm going to kind of gel this course where it's at right now and then make gradual changes in the future. So I think this course is where it's at. But the next topic that I want to talk about is interrupts. Up there. I may have covered interrupts before. I don't think I have with this class. That there, that there. I, I, can't, I, keep, I keep a mental note of which, which topics I covered. I don't. My scheme of work is kind of thrown out. That there. Don't tell the quality assurance people that I threw that scheme of work out the second week of class. But uh, that there. That's a typical American technique, by the way. We we write up a syllabus and then we ignore it the rest of the semester. That there. I I realize that in this country. You do a scheme of work and a syllabus, you're supposed to follow it. We throw that thing away right off the bat because the reason we throw it away is because we kind of go where the students take us. That's there. You know, if I think I'm going too fast, then I slow down. If I think I'm going too slow, I speed up. So I adjust accordingly. And interrupts are toward the latter half, toward the end, that there. Interrupts are on the final exam. So this lecture is on the final exam. Some key points from this lecture, that there. So. I really need to harp that there. So let me, before I go into the slides, let me just kind of jump away from the slides here and talk about what's meant by an interrupt. And an interrupt is basically, I'm doing this, and all of a sudden, I have to do something else. This gentleman here was watching something on his phone, which looks like he's gone back to that there. And I stop him, and now all of a sudden, he's got to go and do something else. And that's listen to the instructor talk for a few minutes. My best example of an interrupt could be you're driving your car down the highway, that there, you're not paying attention, you've got your uh, MP3 player going from your phone, listening to music or whatever, all of a sudden your fuel indicator light goes on on your car. That's an, inter that's an interrupt. Your car is telling you that it needs service. In that particular case, it needs petrol, right there. So. That is not an urgent interrupt. I don't know about your car, <coughs> but my car, the fuel indicator light comes on with about 100 kilometers left in the tank, right there. My wife drives a, a my V, and I don't know what it is about my Vs, but hers comes on when it's got 50 kilometers on, left in the tank. So we can ignore mine longer than we can ignore my wife's car that there. But regardless, we, you know, we get an interrupt that there. Another interrupt that might occur might be your check engine light comes on. That one's probably a more serious interrupt that there. Or your overheating light comes on. That's a very serious one. I don't know how many of you uh, ever work on cars. <clears throat> you know, I grew up in the generation where you know, every teenage boy had a beater car in the garage that they took apart and put together, took apart and put together. I changed my own oil, rebuilt my own heads. Changed my, rebuilt my own carburetors, the carburetors off, changed my own spark plugs. So I grew up in the era where we did a lot of our own car work. And one of the things that happens if you drive a car that's overheated is that the metal that forms the head will warp. And which re means that you've got to take it to the garage and get it reground and flatten it out, or you buy a new head gap head. At best, you, you replace the head gasket, but at worst, you're buying a new set of heads for, for the car. Out there. So you, you don't ignore the check engine light out there, or the temperature sensing light. Out there. So those are interrupts. Now the interrupt that I like to describe best has actually nothing to do with technology. It actually comes more from an ex-wife than it comes from anything else. And this interrupt has nothing to do with my ex-wife in, in her personality or anything else. But she was a nurse. And, and nurses make a good example for this right here because the way that a typical nurse op works up there. And I can say with pretty good certainty that I've spent enough time going and buying dinner for my ex-wife and picking it up and taking it to the hospital and watching the nurses work around the nursing stand, station that I have a good idea how nurses operate, at least in the U.S. And I spent a little bit of time in a hospital here having some surgery done last earlier this year that nurses seem to work the same here as they do anywhere else in the world. And if you're if you're in a hospital at night, welcome everyone up there. I haven't started the, the media thing, so you haven't missed anything yet. It's all been battery. Do you use the term battery here? That's a 
British term used here at concerts at, where the lead singer will talk to the audience in order to distract them while the band members all tune their instruments. They call it banter out there. So it's all been banter. I've just been filming time out there. But, uh, so, but a nurse will sit there if they're working the midnight shift, and my ex-wife used to work the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift, which is the absolute best shift to work if you don't want to work hard. And the reason you don't work hard as a nurse is because there's usually very few medical procedures. There's usually very few doctors on rounds. It's just you and the patients typically between those hours that there. So they have orders. But typically, a nurse will have, have assigned to her five to seven patients that there. And they once an hour, once, an, once an hour, they will go around and, the, and they'll check on all their patients right there. So. Here's the nursing stand, and here's patient one, two, three, four, five, and we'll say six patients in this case, right there. So here's the nurse, and she'll go around and she'll check in this room, she'll check in this room, 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 and then go back here and pull out whatever book they have to be reading or whatever TV show they have to be watching on TV. But they, they're, they're done working for that that hour or so. That there. And, then, and then maybe two hours later, it's time to do meds. And when they do meds, basically, they go around with a little cart and they go into this room and they give, you know they wake the patient up to give them a sleeping pill. That there, you know. And you know, that sounds like a joke, but I've actually seen that happen. That there, they'll wake the patient up to give them a sleeping pill. But again, they do the rounds. Now, in the microprocessor world, we don't have patients, but we have things that we need to service. We, we have sensors we need to read, we have motors we need to update, we have keypads we need to monitor. Those are all events, and they're not unlike a patient in a hospital. When you go around to each patient one at a time, in the processor world, we call that polling. Polling. We, we just simply do our rounds, and we check each patient one at a time, that there. And we do that a lot of times in the process world. It's probably not the most efficient way of doing that, because most of the time, they'll stick their head in, and the patient's at, you know, sleeping, and watching TV, they're fine, and it's kind of wasting their time doing that, but that there. But regardless, and you'll see that, that there, you'll see the same type of behavior happen with security guards that there. You go to the front of this complex here and there's that gate right there. And you'll always see probably two people, sometimes there's only one person sitting there that looks, they look at my car and they say, okay, it's the white guy, we, we know he belongs here, they hit the button, let me in. Whether I have the sticker on the car or not. They're supposed to be looking for the sticker on the car. If they look and they see it's a student and they don't have a, have a staff sticker, they make you park your car in the lot out there, right? That there. If it happens to be a visitor, they'll get, take the information and see if they're see if they're on the list. But you know they're, they're they're at the guard, and then one of the guards will walk around the campus with a little clock thing, and I I don't know how big it is. I'm used to the old ones that the guards used to carry in the U.S. at the factories, and they go around to various places and they check in. That there, you know, now it may just be walking around and just touching this thing to various spots. That there, but they go through and they pull the campus, they do the rounds. They that there, so. In the process world, we call that polling, right there. And polling means basically you go around and you check, right there. Well, polling takes time, right there. When I look at the nurse walking around checking each patient, that's going to take 15, 20 minutes of their time. And that's okay on the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift because the nurse has nothing but time. You know, it's just her and her six patients there. They can't give her more than six patients because if one of the patients needs help, then you know, at, at there, you know, she has to be available. So he or she, you know, in the U.S. you have male nurses and female nurses here. I think I've never seen a. Is there are, are there male nurses here? I've never seen one. Everyone shakes their head. No, you've never seen one either. In the U.S. I, there's a lot of male nurses, but so I have to say he or she. But here I can use the word she. That there. So well. Actually, the nursing profession, to be honest, in the U.S. is one of the best paying jobs there is. My ex-wife made more as a nurse than as I made as a, as a, 
as a fact, as an associate professor at a major university. Nurses make good money in the U.S. They don't hear it from what I understand. That they're, but regardless, that they're so so polling is not necessarily the way they do it. But if we look at our nurses' station, we also have to realize that each of these rooms one, two, three, four, five, and six also have various alarms in them there. So patient in room two may have an IV pump. For those who aren't familiar with an IV pump it is, that's that thing that your arm hangs there and they stick the needle in your arm and you see drip, drip, drip and it puts fluid into you. It's IV stands for intravenous. That there. It's an IV pump and it's pumping either saline solution to, to hydrate you or saline solution with drugs. It may have painkillers, it may have antibiotics, but you have an IV pump. Well, this IV pump has an alarm on it. When it runs empty, it sounds an alarm. When the battery goes dead, if it's on battery, it sounds an alarm. That alarm will tell this nurse to go into that room and change that pump. You either hang a new bag, if the doctor's order says to hang multiple bags or just take the needle out and that, that they're usually they don't take the needle out they just take the hose out and leave the needle in and just put a cap over it that there most hospitals I know in the US will put an IV needle in whether you need it or not and they just don't use it until they need it that there which is a pain in the neck here that fortunately they don't do that that there but an IV pump this room here may have a heart monitor monitor right there so if this guy's heart monitor goes off beep 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 that means his heart stopped beating obviously that's going to interrupt the nurse right there and the interrupt the nurse is going to run right there well when we look at interrupts we see them all the time in our daily life you know you're sitting there at home you're on school holiday and you're watching TV you're dozing off on your couch and your mother yells Mock on, mock on, it's time to eat, right? <laughs> That's an interrupt, right? You got to get up off the couch and go eat your dinner. You know, the call for prayers is an interrupt right there. You're, you know, you know, if, you know if, if you're the type, now some people will ignore it and go pray later. Some people, I tend to pray right when I hear it. The reason I tend to pray right when I hear it, not because I'm a very good Muslim and I'm well behaved, because I'll forget later <laughs> out there. So it's usually a good idea in my case to remember to go do it as soon as I hear the call. Out there. My wife, especially when it comes to Isha, will lay on the couch and take a nap and wake up and pray just before she goes to bed. Out there. So some people will pray right at the prayer time, some people will pray later. But, out there. but that's a, a form of an interrupt. You interrupt what you're doing. Now when I say that prayer time is an interrupt, I'm not saying it's not important. It is important. That's why you do interrupt what you do. Go do it. Out there. Just as this heart monitor, that is that is more important than what this nurse is probably doing sitting at her station, right there. You know, so interrupts occur in, the, it, in order to tell the operator, or in our case, our microprocessor. In the case of the nurse, we're, t we're interrupting the nurse. In the case of you watching TV and you hear the call for prayers, or you or your mother says it's time for time for dinner, to tell you. To stop what you're doing because it's not important and go do something that is important. That's what an interrupt is, 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 gener is generated for. So when we, an interrupt occurs, a certain sequence of events has to happen right there. And we set up interrupts on our microprocessor to handle the various events that we want to interrupt our microprocessor right there. So interrupts are a very important tool. Now, when we look at our nurse, I'm going back to what I see on, on, on the nurses on my ex-wife's floor. Typically, a lot of the nurses that I knew, including my ex-wife, would read sleazy romance novels right there. You know, they would just read books to, to stay busy at night up there. You can only watch so much TV. And besides TV, you can't pause that there. Or they'll sit there and chit-chat with each other right there. But I'm going to use the example of you're reading a book right there. So I'm sitting here reading a book. Read, 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 read. An interrupt occurs. <coughs> well, what's the first thing I'm going to do when I'm reading a book and I'm interrupted? Well, the first thing I do is I 
mark the place in, in the book. In the book. I put a bookmark in my book right there. Usually both, most people that read a lot of books have a little picture have a little bookmark, they sell them in bookstores, or you can just use a piece of paper, <coughs> you can use a, somebody's business card for a bookmark, you just stick something in the book so you know where to go back to. <coughs> that's an important part of this discussion, that's why I got there. And then we get the source of the interrupt. What is causing the interrupt? Right there. And then we service the interrupt, read that there. Interrupt. And then we go back. And on our way back, I forgot to right here. Find place in book. And continue reading. And my handwriting is terrible writing over this keyboard. But that's typically what's happening. You know, we're assuming that this person, and you know, I keep picking on nurses, but you know, I'm, it's a good example because I've watched this probably 20 times that there, there while, you know, while I'm waiting for various things that there. And an alarm goes off in a patient's room. A nurse is sitting there reading a book. She grabs something from the desk, a bookmark or a card or something, sticks it in the book to keep track of where they were at there. That's important. They look at the they look at the nurse's station panel there to see which room it is and what type of interrupt it is. Right there. They go to the room and they take care of it. Now, this is service the interrupt team. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Depending on the type of interrupt, well, it will, will affect what the nurses does. That there, and sometimes a nurse will choose to ignore an interrupt, and we'll talk about masking interrupts and, and, and disabling interrupts. That there, you know, if I have a patient in room 23, for example, that every 10 minutes hits the buzzer and says that they want to want something to drink, that's you know, I'm probably going to ignore him half the time, right there, him or her, right there, right, right there. So, that there, if I have a patient that, for example, is you know, a chronic complainer and always wants pain medication and believe me there are patients like that in hospitals that they want more and more pain pain medication not so much in Malaysia but in the US we have what they call drug seekers people that want pain medication that there because most of the pain medication in the US is narcotic and they like the feeling of taking taking pain medication that there so they'll keep calling the nurse saying I'm in pain I'm in pain what they want is more pain medication you know they want the drugs so you, know, you tend to ignore that patient. They've had their allotment. The doctor said that they can have up to three Percocets you know, in an eight-hour shift. They've had their three Percocets. Or they could have one pain pill every three hours. They had their pain pill two hours ago. They have to wait another hour before they can get another one. So you're going to ignore that patient. That there. You're not going to service that interrupt. That there. So we'll talk a little bit about how that equates to microprocessor codes. Some interrupts are very critical. You can never ignore them. The heart rate monitor. If a heart, you know, if a patient's heart stops, you sh you're supposed to go in there and do a certain set of routines that there. You know, you're supposed to apply CPR, apply, you know, you know, supply the paddles. You know, they do the electro electro shock in order to try to start the heart. You may inject drugs into that. You have to call the doctor. A, a, a particular team in the hospital, I don't know what they call it here, they call it the code blue team in most American hospitals, where they try to re revive the patient. Now some patients in the U.S., I don't know if it's allowed here, can have orders on their chart that say do not resuscitate that there. So if the patient's heart monitor stops, and their heart stops, there's an order from the patient saying, I don't want to be brought back. You know, if I die on the, in, in the hospital, let me die. That there. So, so you would treat that patient differently than you would say another patient. So part of that protocol would be the check to see if there's a do not resuscitate order. That there. They call it DNR, do not resuscitate. That's an order that a patient will put on there, usually somebody in their 80s or 90s who has bad health, that's 
you know, that's been treated for cancer and, you know, they're just tired of fighting, fighting, fighting. They're, they're not going to commit suicide because they consider it a sin, but if they die, just let me die type thing. They don't want to. And then there are other people that are 30 years old that if you resuscitate them, they're probably going to live another 50 years, and you probably do want to go through the effort to bring the person back. So there's some judgment calls to be had. And that's all part of this interrupt service routine. You go through and you decide what has to be done that there. Now, in our microprocessor world, we're going to write software to handle those steps. That there. You know, most of the things we do are not as important as resuscitating a patient who's start hard to stop. Sometimes they are. You know, if we're writing software to control a nuclear power plant and a failure occurs, then by all means, what we do to service that interrupt can affect the lives of tens of thousands of people right there. And when those types of failures occur and they're not handled properly, we have instances like Chernobyl and Soviet Union about 20 years or 15 years ago. I don't know if anybody have ever heard ever heard about Chernobyl. That was a nuclear power plant in, in uh, western Russia that had a meltdown probably about 25 years ago. There was one in the U.S. in a place called Three Mile Island that had a major meltdown that you know, the entire area around the town has been evacuated now for 25 years and nobody can live there. Recently, there was one in Japan that had a failure at their nuclear power plants. How you handle the first 40, 50 seconds of a failure is critical. And that all has to be computerized control because people can't react fast enough back there. Many, many other disasters have been averted big because of computer intervention and control of the situation. These three are ones where, the, where <laughs> it didn't happen. Things failed and they failed big time. That thing. But when we look, look at that here, when brakes fail in a car, in a modern vehicle, what does the vehicle do to, to react to the fact that the brakes are failing? What can it can they do? Modern vehicles have a lot of safety features where they can react to that. There's a lot of new vehicles, for example, that have sensors that tell that you're going too fast and you're the distance between the car in front of you and your car is is becoming dangerously close, and some of the newer vehicles actually apply the brake for you. You know, you're dozing off, and all of a sudden you're you're looking at your phone, and you fail to notice that the car in front of you stopped. Your car will stop for you now. You know, those are examples of how computer control is taking over some things that people don't react fast enough for. That there. So getting back now to my discussion here, that's what an interrupt is. And that's why we need interrupts out there. We need interrupts. They're a very critical part of programming microcontroller systems and embedded systems. Interrupts are not as important, even though they're used for general purpose computer applications. They're used more from a software standpoint that, to tell whether something happens or you generate the interrupts instead of calling functions out there. The early version of DOS used interrupts where I would load things into a certain register and I would call an interrupt to output it to the printer. That's really I've not interrupts the way that I look at interrupts. Interrupts are something occurs that you want to react to that is out of the, maybe out of the ordinary or maybe something that you don't know what's going to, to happen right there. So we're going to be looking, so that's what interrupts are for there. So we're going to kind of go through these steps here that there. I'm going to spend more time on the generalities of interrupts as I have on most things in this class and not so much on the specifics of how we do it with this particular controller because what I want to get across is the concept of interrupts, why they work, why they're important, and just give some examples of how it's done here. But on the final exam, I'm not going to force you to you know, tell me the interrupt vector for a particular interrupt. That there. I'm not going to make you memorize those. That there. So, okay. This is some terminology. I kind of explained this already. An interrupt is an occurrence of a condition that causes a temporary suspension while the program is being serviced by another subprogram. All right, that's a fancy word of saying something happens and, and you have to stop what you're doing and do something else. That's really what that says. Right there. Interrupts are important. They allow the system to respond asynchronously to an event and deal with the event while in the middle of performing a, a task. Okay. If I did not have alarms on my nurse's station, that, you know, that there, 
the patient in room, you know, patient number four in my list of six patients, his heart stops beating. And there's no alarms, there's no interrupt system. That nurse will not know that that heart has stopped beating and that patient needs to be resuscitated till she does her next round. So how often does she do rounds? Every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour? So that patient's gonna be lying there with a stopped heart until that nurse happens to walk around and check again. Out there. By allowing an interrupt, you know, an alarm to go off in that room to where the, it sounds the, either a buzzer on the nurse's stand or it's loud enough the nurse can hear it from the nurse's station. The interrupt, the nurse can respond to the alarm immediately, not waiting till the next time they check on that patient. And that's what this particular discussion is saying to us is that interrupt it allows the, the system to respond asynchronous. Asynchronous means, you should have that in your basic digital, means it doesn't wait till the next clock cycle. It doesn't wait till the next rounds. We respond immediately right there and deal with the event while in the middle of performing another task. Now what I didn't say in my discussion is that the nurse could be servicing an interrupt in one room and get an interrupt from a second room while servicing that interrupt out there. And later we will look at priorities of interrupts. Obviously the little call button from the patient that wants pain medication every 15 minutes is not important as important as the patient whose heart rate monitors be buzzes. Probably the patient that their IV pump is gone dry is probably more important than the one who wants his pillow fluffed or wants something from the canteen set up right there. You know, so when we look at interrupts, they have different priorities. You know, I'm laying in a hospital bed and I'm bored and I want you know I want the nurse to plug in my iPad because it's the, the battery's going dead on my iPad so that I can watch a movie. That's probably not as important as making sure the patient in the room next to me whose cable broke on their broken leg is is taken care of. You know, my iPad Cord probably wait. So we have priorities. So, so when we talk about in the event of performing another task, it may be something other than reading the book. It may be doing something that is part of the job. They may be, you know, sitting there getting ready to order something from the canteen and the heart rate monitor goes off. So now instead of putting a, a, a book, you know, the nurse has got two things to do now when she, when she gets back from servicing the heart rate monitor that there, go there. They, she has to go back and remember to order my my dinner because I'm hungry. I'm going to start complaining if I don't get my dinner in 30 minutes. So she's got to remember to do that and then she's got to go back to her book. So there may be multiple interrupts that occur that there and you can you handle those in a priority order right there. An interrupt system gives the illusion of doing many different things simultaneously right there. So when we say the illusion, a processor can do only one thing at a time, but it's doing one thing, it gets interrupted, goes, takes care of it, comes back and does what it was working on. So it, it's doing this, it goes off, does this, and then comes back and does this right there. So it looks like, because this happens so quickly, that it's doing both of them at the same time right there. So it gives the illusion of doing multiple things up there. So then we, we, the last one here is getting away from, doesn't really fit into this here. This one here is, is getting more into the detail. And this is the sub program or sub routine that deals with an interrupt is called the interrupt service routine or interrupt handler. We'll talk a little, I'm gonna talk more about that term right there, but you'll see this term. Matter of fact, I think well, one of the final exams, I don't think it's one that I wrote, but one someone else wrote, you're at someone asked, what is an ISR? You know, what what is meant by ISR? And it's an interrupt service routine right there. And that is the code that actually services the interrupt right there. So, you know, because they should have broke that, put that on the next page. The ISR executes a response to interrupt, generally performs an input or output operation to the device. So the ISR is the code that we write to service the interrupt. Now, the interrupts that I gave you are interrupts that require human intervention. 
you know, when I talk about human intervention, I'm saying that the nurse stops what they're doing and they go into the room. Well, we're looking at a microprocessor system. Let's use the example of the IV pump that I gave right there. The IV pump is pumping fluid out through a tube that there, and it does it in such a way that so many milliliters goes into the patient's blood per hour, that type thing there. So it does a very slow pumping. Well, it has various interrupts in its system to detect malfunctions. Now, our interrupt service routine can carry different types of activities, but let's just kind of look at this example right here. Here is, here's our pump right here. Here's our tube coming out. That's going to the patient's arm. And here's our little flow meter right here. It, there's a little pump here that pumps our fluid into this tube right here. It's just pumping the tube that there. And it's pumping at, at a preset that there. Well, multiple things can go wrong. We have a sensor here that senses the flow rate right there. If that sensor says that this is plugged, that the fluid is not moving, there's a problem. The tube is plugged right there. So we can do two things. You, we may give it a big boost of high pressure to try to break the plug. And after, if that doesn't break, if it breaks the plug, we go back and we continue pumping normally, or we just sound an alarm. You know, our interrupt may just turn the pump off and sound the alarm. It requires a human intervention. We have another sensor that senses the weight of the bag and tells when the bag is empty. Empty, right there. And when that bag is empty, we shut the pump off and sound the alarm. That's, so the, so the, that sensor triggers an interrupt to, to tell our hardware to do something. Our hardware, in this case, does not change the bag. It just sounds the alarm and tells, tells the, uh, the operator, which in this case is the nurse, or the technician in the hospital to put a, to hang another bag or just set, set it aside or, or, or to handle it. But we have to have the interrupt in our hardware in order to sound the alarm right there. Other interrupts may occur when you have a motion sensor on a car that, that, that calculates the speed and the distance between the vehicle in front of you that determines that you're going too fast and you're not able to stop. And that interrupt service routine applies to brake on your vehicle. Got there. Another interrupt might occur when you're backing up and the object behind you is too close and sounds an alarm. A lot of modern vehicles have those sensors there. I wish they put them on the side fronts too. Got there. Got there. So, so if you get too close as you're trying to negotiate a parking place, it also sounds an alarm if you're going to hit there. But the key thing is that we see lots of interrupts on hardware. And what we look at there is we have to do something to service it right there. In, and like I said, the case of our IV pump, we have two, two here. We can have a sensor that looks for a plug in the line. We also have another one that looks for an empty bag. We can also have another one that looks for too little pressure. In other words, the hose has come off and the water is dropping onto the floor. So we have multiple sensors that are sensing for malfunctions. And each one of them, those will trigger an interrupt. You know, our core thing our processor is doing is keeping the pump flowing at a constant rate and adjusting the pump flow. But if the, if the line gets plugged or the line gets disconnected or the bag runs empty, we have to do something. So we have these various interrupts that occur. <coughs> and that's what the inter interrupt service routine is that there. Now, at this po point, point in time, I'm not telling you how to write the interrupt service routine. I'm just covering what the idea is, is that we have various sensors and various things that will trigger interrupts, various events. Got there. One, one type interrupt service routine is, uh, is the reset is, of course, that's the ultimate when the reset button is pressed, that resets the processor back to zero. That's, that is also an interrupt as well, the reset button that there. So, when the, when the reset occurs, the main program temporarily suspends and branches that there. So it stops what it's doing and goes and services. Just like the nurse stops what she is doing and goes and services that patient. 
So that's why I use the nurse's example. It's kind of a visual way of seeing what's going to happen, is that when this interrupt occurs, the processor stops what it's doing, and it takes care of the interrupt. That there. It executes, it, the ISR executes, performs the desired operation, and terminates with a particular instruction. RTI is return from interrupt. Now, I'm actually doing this a little bit out of order. I, I have another lecture that I'm going to do talking about subroutines that I, some, that I normally would do first. And I, I kind of skipped that there. I just now realize that. But return, RET is a, if you call a subroutine, you do a return, it means you go back to that there. And everyone here has had C programming, right? That there. So you know what I mean by a subroutine, right? You know, you call a function in C, right? Right there. So, in other words, if you say A is equal to tangent B, right there. Tangent is a, tan is a function in C, right there. And B is the variable you pass that function. Tan calls mathematical function in the C library to calculate the tangent of B, right there. At the end of that subroutine, it returns the tangent of, of B, and that's then placed in A, right there. But this is a function call, right there. We have other function calls that we can, we write our own functions, right there. You can, you can write a function, you know, I can write a function C that I'm going to return back an int, and I'm going to pass it, I'm going, to, I'm going to call it average, and I'm going to pass it num, num1, num2, num3, there's supposed to be you there, right there, and I can say return num1 plus num2 plus num3 divided by 3, right there, and that's my function, right? You've seen something like that. That's a very simple function right there. But right there, well, th what this return line does is we, if, if I wrote this function in C and, and uh, converted it to assembly language, which is what the compiler does anyway, this is going to, re this is going to generate a return line, a return command at the end of the function in assembly language. But before that, it's going to move into A, whatever the average is. You know, in other words, we would have, we would have to calculate this out there. But this re generates a return line, and what that return does is it tells the processor to go back and to where it was at, right there. Well, if we're dealing with interrupts, we use interrupt return from interrupt. And the reason we use return from interrupt is that the process is slightly different from returning from an interrupt than it is returning from a normal subroutine call, right there. In normal assembly language, I would do call AVG right there. And then down here somewhere, I would have a function AVG right here. That would be the label for it. And then I would have some code here. And then at the end, there would be a return right there. That's how I. That's how I do. How I do a subroutine call in assembly language. We'll come back to that probably next week, right there, on how we do assembly language, do calls in assembly language, right there. But that, but we do a call. Here's our function here, and before we call that, we have to have some things in certain places, right there. We can't pass variables in assembly language like we do C, right there. So, so we we would have that there, and then we would have to put the. Re put the average in a particular place to where we know where it's going to be when we, we, we deal with that there. So when we deal with, when I write subroutines in C, we have to handle the pass the variables to it. That's a subject more difficult than, than the interrupt. That's why I'm not there. But a subroutine uses RET, and to call the subroutine, I just do, use the call command right there. And there's also an A call as well, absolute call <coughs> right there. There's different types of calls right there. We haven't talked about that there. But when we deal with interrupt service routines, these are, these are again, these are subroutines that we do not call. They're called by the interrupt. 
when we generate the interrupt right there. Okay, this is the official flow stack right there, right here. And I just mentioned something very important, and that was that things happen differently. What happens differently is this right here. Because we don't know where things happen when we do an interrupt call, the registers are pushed onto the stack. When we talk about registers R through zero, R zero through R seven, we tend to use those for various functions right there. But if we want to use them in our interrupt service routine, we have to restore them back to where they were before. So, as it turns out. The microprocessor does that for us automatically, right there. It doesn't do that for us automatically if we do a call. So when we look at calls, typically before we call a function, we'll place our variables in our various registers, we will do our, execute our code within there, and we will put our results back in the registers where we know them they're going to be. But because interrupts occur, asynchronously at any point in time we have to store the status of the microprocessor before that. Now one thing important to note is that any memory locations that are used within our interrupt service routine are not restored back. That there are any outputs we change, inputs or outputs we change are not restored back. Only the registers and I'm sorry, I keep hitting the right side of this up there. The registers are the only thing that are restored. So if we've got a program that is used in interrupts, it's important that we keep information that needs to be kept in the, in the registers, or when we write our ISR, we don't use memory locations that are needed elsewhere in our program. We use localized, well, you know, we only use memory locations that are just used for handling that interrupt. We don't try to, we don't use general purpose. Because if we're using, say, for example, here in our program, we're using location 30, 35, 36. These all have H's at the end of up there. If we're using these memory locations here and we change them there, when we go back to here, those memory locations have been changed. If we're using R0 through R7, they're restored back right there. So I will say if you want to take anything out of today's class that's going to help you on the final exam, knowing this chart is probably a good hint <laughs> right there. I, I will just tell you right point blank that a typical question for me is outline what happens when an interrupt occurs. And I would consider regurgitating this chart as a valid answer right there. This is what happens when an interrupt occurs on the 8051. This is a sequence of events. So, so that, you know, as I say, if anything else out of today's lecture, this chart is definitely something that I would say you should need to know. Okay. Now, getting more into the details, and I'm going to kind of skip through these relatively quickly, but I'm going to hit a couple of them out there. i got plenty of time. The 8051 F020, which is not our processor, we're using the 850, but the F20 is one that they include in their educational package, so it's what they give us on you know, the slides that they supply, has 22 interrupt services. We actually have, we're, we're missing these two right there, and I think, I think we only have this one here on the external. I think we only have one external interrupt. And we have to enable it. We use one of our pins that are set through the crossbar. So interrupt zero is available, but we have to enable it through the crossbar right there. We also only have, we have our timer interrupts. We have four timers. We don't have timer four on our processor. And we have our serial interrupt. We have one serial port right there. So each interrupt has one or more interrupt pending flag associated with it in an I that there so there is a flag attended for each interrupt. 
So whenever an interrupt is generated, it sets a flag someplace. Which flag it sets is a dependent on what interrupt there. There, we can use these interrupt flags in a very easy way. For example, <coughs> for example, if we want to use, and we haven't talked about analog, the analog ports on this particular that there. But let me just kind of give an example here. If we look at the analog, analog. to digital converter ADC, zero, ADC zero, right there. It has a special function register right there that's de dedicated to controlling this particular analog port right there. And in that is there's a ADC zero busy is one of the bits in that particular special function register. And I can do in C, or I can do set bit ADC zero right there, right there. That writes a one to that bit right there. So I, this is the C command. This is the assembly language command. That writes a one to that bit. That starts a conversion right there. There's also another bit there, and I can just simply say jump no bit ADC zero interrupt right there and I can put a dollar sign there dollar sign means the same location right there right there so I can jump that there this is going to wait for that bit to go high so in this particular case I'm not using the interrupt I'm not calling an interrupt service routine but I'm starting the analog to digital conversion by writing a one to ADC zero busy. This should be ADC zero busy busy. I'm sorry, right here. This should be busy right there. I write a one to that particular bit in the special function register. That starts an analog to digital conversion process right there. When the analog to digital conversion process is done, the ADC set, puts a one in the interrupt flag and generates the interrupt. Well, if I have not enabled the interrupt, I won't see it. It won't call the interrupt service routine that there. But I can still use the bit to see when the interrupt, when the, the analog to digital conversion is complete. So we will quite often use this interrupt pending flag for purposes other than generating the interrupt that there. So it, it is kind of an interesting note that we use this flag and it's a very common way if I want to read a sensor, an analog sensor, is that I will write a one to that particular ADC zero bit that starts the conversion and then I wait for the reading and then I process, you know, then I read, I read the, you know, the data from the analog port and I process it right there. So that's it. So when a peripheral or external source beats a valid interrupt condition, so associated interrupt pending flag is set to a one. So in this particular example I gave you, ADC zero is done converting that there. So it's going to generate an interrupt that there. They're level sensitive. They are not cleared by that, that there. Will trigger again. Now this is an important note here that I that I should also point out that there you should you should need to know is that usually the first thing you do when you service an interrupt is you clear the interrupt flag right there. So if I, because otherwise it'll keep triggering right there. Because once that flag is set, it's not automatically set when I go into the ISR. So usually the very first thing you do in your ISR is you, is you turn off the alarm. You know, let's say this room has a burglar alarm attached to it right there. You know, that there, or a motion sensor, and alarm goes off. At, that there, the first thing the guard's going to do when he walks in is he's going to push a button and turn the alarm off. He's not going to sit here with that alarm going off, 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 off. That there. Then he's going to try to figure out what tripped the alarm and service service the interrupt. So you, the first thing a nurse would do when, when the heart rate monitor is going beep, 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 right there, is push the button to turn the alarm off because we've now acknowledged the interrupt and we're not going to service it. That there. So, there. Now, interrupts are all disabled after system reset and enabled individually by software. So,
So the only interrupt you cannot disable is the reset interrupt. Right there. The inter reset interrupt is always there. Up there. And for good reason, because that's usually when you power down and power up the processor, you want to use the interrupt, interrupt up there. If the system locks up, you want to reset it. Later on, we'll in a little bit, in another week or so, we'll talk about the watchdog timer in more detail. And that also triggers triggers a, a, a reset. So the so the reset, you cannot disable. But all other interrupts are automatically disabled when you first power up right there. Right there. So here is a list of interrupts. And as you can see, the list is, in this particular case, is 22 long. We don't have all of them on our processor right there, right there. And these are, are the priority order in which they are. I mentioned that they have, some have higher priority than others. So if I'm servicing a timer one overflow and the external interrupt zero occurs, I'm going to go ahead and process it. Right there. Now, the, it, the reset I can never ignore. Now what we've got here are the interrupt vectors right there. This is what if an interrupt occurs and it's enabled. Right there. See, there's a key thing is we have to, you know, an interrupt has to be enabled for it to happen. Right there. Right there. And we will then go to the interrupt service routine location and start executing code. Right there. Going back to our, right there. We will push the stack pointer onto the stack, push registers onto the stack. We'll talk about the stack in a little bit more detail in a minute. Probably we won't talk about it too much today. That there, we will push the stack pointer onto the stack. We'll push registers onto the stack. We'll execute the code. This code has to be located. Is located. This is ISR. This comes from the interrupt vector table right there. This tells us right here where that code occurs. If we use a timer three interrupt, for example, here's our timer three interrupt right there. It's at memory location 73 hex in memory, right there. Now this is in code memory, right there. So, 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 right there. Now, when we look at, for example, let me bring up Hopefully I can bring up Winky. Open with. If we look at Boinky, you'll see here at the beginning of our code, we have a section that we, we didn't talk about much. It's called reset and interrupt vector. Now, what we have there is we've got a line here that says CSEG at zero L jump main, right there. If I have any other interrupts, I would have to place in the beginning of my code the CSEG at and The interrupt vector for that. So, if, for example, I'm going to use timer three overflow. So I would put a line here. C seg at zero zero. What was that? Seventy three. What's that? Seventy three x right there. Right there. And then I would do an L jump. L jump. Timer, timer three ISR right there. And then somewhere down here, I would place a timer three. ISR code 
to service timer three interrupt right there. I would write my code right there, and then I would do a RTI. So that's how I would handle interrupts in my code right there. So, so the timer, so the interrupt service routine is important because the vector table is it tells us where we need to, how we need to handle that in our code right there. Is that we have to place any interrupts we're going to use has to be at the beginning of our code and specified where the ISR for that particular code is. So, and the way that is done is we use this top part right here where we say interrupt vector C seg at zero L jump main. That's our interrupt service routine for reset. Here we have a timer three ISR. We have wrote it. I don't know what it is. I haven't enabled it or anything. I've just showing how we would put the how we would handle it in our code. We'll deal later with processing it right there. But then at the end before the end of our file right here, this is it'll never get to this because this has a jump to loop two right here. So it stays in this loop right here. Right there. So it will never get to this line of code on its own. So when timer three generates, it's automatically taken care of right there. Now that there. So if I compile this right here and you know, I'm just going to copy it right there. Edit. Collect all and copy. If I compile this, and I don't I didn't bring a processor with me right there or anything, but uh, I'm just gonna show Uh, actually, uh, they have a new uh, compiler out today now. It's supposed to be easier to use. I have not spent time playing with it, so I have not changed the simplicity. So, in this particular case, that compile perfectly fine. That there, if we want to view, I can't turn on the assembly language right there, right there, because I don't have the processor. If I look at the list file, what you'll see right here. Right here, if we, if we look at this right here, what you'll notice is that this address right here, and this this one's kind of funny. This one did a weird thing to me because and I'm about ready to wrap it up here because. I'm now quite out there. So again, this right here, see, jump, and what this basically does the, is this just simply says long jump to 20, that's the code for that there. And in this particular case, because I have no code, it didn't do any, it didn't put any address to it right there. Because the start of my code, Main right here, 
right there. Dis disrupt. There, this starts right there. The, the, the assembler, because I have nothing in here, didn't do anything. <laughs> didn't put any code right there. Well, actually, no. Actually, this puts it at location 21, and then the only command right there. So it's on location 21 is where the timer service routine. So this should be, this looks like it's a long jump to location 20. That's where it's at right there. So it did put it, it, did put it in there. But right there. But that's how you would. But I'm going to stop at this point. But this is how you would handle the, 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 the long jump. This is how you handle adding the interrupt right there. And again, down here, this is where you would generate, you would put the code. We haven't got into how we would write the code, what type of code we would write. We have to come up with specific examples for that there. Right there. So I think I'm going to stop at this point here. And really, I will come back to this here. I probably won't get into much more detail. The highlights, which you're going to see on the final exam, I've covered today. The rest of this is a little bit more detail on how it's done in this processor. I'm not going to hold you responsible for that, the, the tight detail on the final. Really, what I'm looking at at this on, when it's interrupt is just the concepts that's there. It will do a lab where we would use one of the timers to set up the interrupt to do blinking. We'll redo blinking using an interrupt right there. So interrupts actually are much easier to handle and see than they are in some way. <laughs> so normally when we write interrupt service routines, we're normally working with C. Actually, I think I mentioned earlier in the class that typically using C is a more common way of using microcontrollers than assembly language. That's more into understanding how they work. But we'll do one with C. I'll show you how it's blinking is handled using the timer three interrupt. But we'll modify timer blinking to use interrupts to see how we would use an interrupt. And we could set up the external to set it to one of the push buttons. And every time we hit the push button, it will call the interrupt as well. So we have, we could, we'll do a couple of interrupt labs up there. Hopefully I can get something done by next week and I'll have some lab for us where we'll see interrupt using Blinky at least. We'll redo Blinky using the interrupts up there. Because as I recall, you use this version of Blinky. Or not. This version of Blinky is what you, we use right there, right? Where we had the nested loop. So we're going to take all this out and we're just going to have a simple little loop where we just do nothing. And then whenever an interrupt occurs, we'll toggle the light up there. And we'll use one of the timers to, to set up the that we'll set the timer. So I'll have to talk a little bit about setting the timer up and then setting up the interrupt for the timer right there. So, okay. With that said, yeah, of course I had probably 10, 15 minutes of 